Thank you, and the members of the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Club, thank you for inviting me. I guess the presentation give you a little introduction about myself. Um, I started collecting stamps when I was about 10 years old. About when I was 11 years old, I was walking down the alley with my brother one day, and we saw a stamp collection in the trash. Oh, wow. So we went and asked the person that the trash barrel that was if we could have that collection that she threw in the trash. And the lady said yes, and that got me started collecting stamps. It was quite a few British stamps, and it's a, not a bad collection at the time, but it's just the, the, the beautiful art of engraving just caught my eye, and I fell in love with it. And I couldn't explain it at the time, but now that I get a little bit older, I realize what it is. It is an amazing art that they did this with just, you know, at, at most uh, a magnifying glass. And did, uh, early on, they didn't even have electric lighting. They had just natural lighting is all they had. I thought, well, I'll give a presentation about one of the early engraved stamps of the United States. So came down here to the library and read a couple of books. And this is the result. Now, I'm a real novice, so you have a lot, I'm sure all of you have a lot that you can tell me about stamp collecting. And so when I talk about some of this, just interrupt me and add to this program, because this is all, this is our program, it's not mine. Uh, so I look forward to learning a lot from, from all of you. These stamps in this series are relatively small. And some of the pictures inside these stamps were really small. And the engraving to me was is amazing. When I started to study about these stamps, I didn't realize at this time, in this, in this case, it's about 1869, 1870, that stamps were such a political statement. They were really a very major political statement. I guess we didn't have TV or radio. We had a few pictures in the newspaper that were limited but a real way of communicating were through postage stamps. So we'll, I think we'll begin to learn that. And what I'm gonna do is when we talk about some of these stamps, I'm gonna have my wife Carla here, read some of the comments that were in the newspaper or the philatelic mm -hmm. journal at the time. And I think that it'll be kind of amazing. So this is about the US Postal Series 112 to 122. It was later reissued, not once, but twice. One of them was re reissued a second time, and that was the 133. So we'll start with that. So this is the first pictorial series issued by the United States Postal System. And it was issued in March 1869 uh, by the National Bank Note Company and it was printed on hard woven paper and uh, it was perforated 12. Most stamps were grilled and all stamps were redesigned at the last minute with larger numbers. In other words, they had proofs that the National Bank note company came up with, but the US Postal System, system did not like the small numerals. So they said, you have to be bigger. People have to be able to see this thing. These are relatively small stamps. Okay, and I have my book open. I have a few of them. I don't have all of them. I'll give you a little background. The postal system wanted some new stamps. The current stamps had been in use for over six years during the Civil War. The printing plates were getting worn and um, the contract with the National Bank Company was ready to expire. Uh, the postal system in their bid requested it should be a variety of sizes as well as designs of the stamp. And they wanted to include the monetary values of 1, 2, 3, 6, 10, 12, 15, 24, 30, and 90 cents. Continuing the background, Civil War had just ended. The U.S. Postal Service wanted to honor the postal system. You know how letters were delivered. Okay, good enough. And they also wanted to begin with Benjamin Franklin, he was the first postmaster of British North America. I think you knew that. And then later became postmaster of the United States. And so they wanted to honor him and they wanted to honor modes of transportation for delivering the mail. And finally, any stamp of this series 
had to honor George Washington. It just wouldn't be complete without honoring George Washington. I mean, he would be uh, yeah. sent to jail if he didn't have George Washington on the series. And they wanted to honor Lincoln as well. Continue with the background, postal system that I had wanted, the stamps must be prepared in such a manner that any attempt to remove them from the letter or packet will so manipulate them as to render them useless. And they also wanted the ink and the cancellation to soak into the stamp so that they couldn't be reused. I mean, a few cents in those days was a lot of money. Yeah. It's quite different today. And of course, no series, like I said before, would have been complete without honoring George Washington. Post office now wanted to honor Lincoln, who was recently assassinated, the president during the Civil War. Led us through a very difficult time in our history. And the stamps had to show pride of nationalism. That was really important. I didn't, by reading some of these books, I didn't really, had no idea how important it was. That we, we can't relate to that today. And I think that's one of the things that makes it exciting about stamp collecting is we learn a lot about our history, at least about 1850 or so, about the history of the, the world. And, and, uh, and I didn't realize it was so, so significant. The press really criticized this series of stamps very severely. And this is one of, this is a three cent stamp. Calling the stamps neither historical, national, or beautiful. What is there in a big chimney on a railroad carriage to indicate the nationality of our postal system? That is an almost an exact copy of, I believe, a New Brunswick number one stamp that was published in 1851. The railroad cars has a big chimney going in the same direction. It's almost identical. Hmm. So maybe that's where they got the idea. I don't know. Other complaints include poor quality gum, jokes that the stamps are so small you need a <laughs> microscope to see them. You, you could lose them in your billfolds, you know, whatever. Okay, go ahead. And some of the criticism. Now, this is interesting. We don't know. But we don't know if the criticism was started by some of the competitors in the bid. It may have been the company that lost the bid that started some of this criticism. And later, I'm going to give you a different twist altogether. And it, and it come, some come from the American Philatelic Society and some from the newspapers. But the Butler Carpenter Company lost the bid. And so we think some of the criticism started from them. They lost the bid for this issue in these stands. Because of their odd size and few familiar portraits, these stamps were not popular with the general public. However, today, they are very popular with collectors and they're, they're a real premium for some of these stamps. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe some of you have a complete series. Uh, I talked to one person out here. He said, yeah, I have a complete series and I also have the reissue series. I mean, my gosh, I don't really have close to that. Yeah. So I'm just they're a really small collector. They are the first U.S. pictorial stamps that picture anything other than the bust of a white male, probably President or Benjamin Franklin. I mean, that's that was it. it was a famous American leader. It had to be a famous American leader. These are the first adhesive bicolor stamps issued by the United States Postal System, and shortest series, at least up to that time, ever printed, less than one year. Some of the 15, 24, and 30 cent values, which have inverted and printed the picture first and the frame is upside down to the picture, are extremely valuable. The first set were grilled. The reissued stamps were not. So what is a grill? Well, why were the stamps grilled? You can see what the grills are. And these, in this case, they were pressed from the face down, face going to the uh, adhesive side. And they were just a little impressions on the stamp to break up the fibers of the paper. One can see the grill, grill marks. Well, not always. You can't always see them. Sometimes they're <coughs> kind of kind of light. And the reissue stamps are more rare than the original stamps. So you have to be careful if you want to buy some of the reissued stamps to make sure they are grilled, because some of the people try to press out the grill marks and sometimes you can't see them anyway. 
So you really, if you want to get the reissued series, you want to make sure that you know what you're buying. Okay, this is a picture of the grill marks. It doesn't cover the entire stamp. So stamp collectors use grill, the U.S. used grill on stamps between 1867 and 1875. And it's so that they couldn't be, the cancellations couldn't be re erased and you couldn't easily get the stamp off the, off the cover without damaging it. Gary, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was unclear about what you said. With when they applied the grill, did they do it from the from the face of the grill on that side, or did they do it from the gun side? Actually, they did it both ways. Okay, it was pressed but from both directions. This series, he only did it from the face of the stamp down. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but that's a good question. They did it both ways, and I'll cover a little bit of that. But, but and thank you for the question. Do do stop me. I think we'll learn a lot more. Grills were placed on a stamp with a special roller, and the cancellation ink was hoped that it would absorb into the fibers of the uh, paper better. You couldn't erase it so well. And the stamp would likely tear if you tried to get it off because of the grill marks. And remember, if you had a 30 cent stamp those days, that's probably a, a, took a couple days' wages <laughs> or more. That's a lot. There are the vertical grill marks and the horizontal. The grills are points or in rows or pyramids that are point down. From the gum side, it points up, and if it points down, uh, it's embossed down. And so the ridges, now I haven't been able to look at them close enough to tell, but the little ridges you can see between the points, there's a vertical little ridge and a horizontal. There's only one type that has a horizontal ridge, and that's a Z grill, and it's extremely rare. Here's all the different types of grill marks. The A type was the entire, covered the entire stamp. The, uh, the B had certain size. You can see the size there and the number of points. It has the number of points. And you see whether it's up or down. Now, the ones of, of this series are all G grill. Uh, uh, that we use only the G. And they were all down. That was from the face side down. Sometimes one can see the grill marks, uh, but sometimes you need water fluid to see them. And sometimes you need some good light. And if we want to, after I have a few of the stamps of the series, I have, in fact, of the main issue, I have all but the highest value one. And then I have one of the reissued ones. We can pull one out and you can look at the grill marks. If we can get good light, you can see it. With, we can take a look at them. If, if, if you're like me, I really hadn't studied them before, so I didn't know much about them. And I haven't been able to count this number of those points. I need a better <laughs> magnifying glass. But the stamps, the, this series, the 112 to 122, are the only ones that use the grill, the G type of grill marks. One of the things is that you need with this stamp, they were reissued on hard paper, and the first ones were soft. And you can tell the difference at the perforations. If you blow them up, you can see these little fibers on the soft paper, whereas on the hard paper, you see a much cleaner cut. And so that's how you can tell the difference between the first series and the reissued series. And also, um, one has grill and the other does not. Okay. Were these, were these stamps individually or were they in blocks of four or blocks of 12 or something like that? They were individual but it was a whole series. And so you, you bought one stamp. Yeah, I'm just saying, does it tearing and tearing from the way? Oh, no, no, they were, they were in sheets. They were in sheets that we meant. Yeah, they were sheets you had. They were perforated and were sheets. So the, the one stamp honored uh, Benjamin Franklin, and it's an, almost an exact copy of an earlier stamp, a 30 cent stamp. And he was the first postmaster general of British North America. Uh, that's before they issued stamps. One stamp one was printed in two shades, a dark brown uh, and, and a brown orange. Uh, these these all had grill marks, but sometimes they accidentally put a, two sets of grill marks on these times. Sometimes it's on the side. Some to get, get a half a set of grill marks. And if you're into that, sometimes they are more valuable if you have split grill marks and this kind of thing, 
Um, so you may want to look on the back of the stamp and see combination of grill marks. And without grill marks, it's extremely rare and only found mint on this series. Okay. And uh, let's see. The bust of uh, Benjamin Franks is very similar to the 30 cent Scott's number 71. Um, I'd like Carla to read what they said about this stamp. Okay. A one cent stamp was needed on drop letters in localities where there was no carrier delivery, in doubles for carrier delivery in cities, and triples for regular three cent domestic letter rate. The criticism of this stamp by the contemporary philatelic press was not as great as that of some of the other values due to the retention of Franklin as the theme. Thus, we consider um, this, we consider a neat stamp, not particularly noticeable for elegance, but still equal to any of the last issue. Okay, this is a two cent. This is supposed to be a post. It's not a Pony Express, by the way. It's a uh, post horse and rider with U.S. mail. And you see, okay, was printed in three different shades, pale brown, dark brown, and yellow brown. And uh, double or split grills on the back are more valuable. And without grill, extremely rare, and you can only find them mint. Okay, so look, look, say about this. The two cent rate was for carrier delivery and drop letters in cities, unsealed circulars, and certain second and third class matter. Doubles were for the four cent partial prepaid rate to France by way of England. The portrait of Andrew Jackson used on previous series had been eliminated and the press was critical. Post horse and writer really very beautiful and equal to any stamp that has been engraved. So said the New York Herald. Oh no, that was the journal. The New York Herald said, um, the two cent stamp represents a man on horseback. This represents Booth's death ride into Maryland. <laughs> and this is the first stamp issued without a portrait of some man and for the US postal system. Hmm, okay. And uh, it's great. Horseman. Yeah. Yeah, horseman. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this is a three cent stamp. And it was, this was, the, this was the most common issued stamp of the whole series. And it's the least valuable because of its, uh, the number printed. And let's go ahead. Uh, it's printed in two shades uh, pale uh, ultramarine and dark ultramarine, printed with. The different grill arrangements, you know, split grill, double grill, single grill. Uh, and again, without a grill, it's only found in mint. I don't know why it's only mint. Maybe they didn't serve they bring the, oh. the single rate for domestic letters required the three cent stamp. Doubles could be used for the single letter rate to Canada and Great Britain. Public opinion, as expressed in the press, was negative since the portrait of Washington had been replaced by a locomotive. The American Journal of Philatelic, Philately, sorry, expressed the opinion that it was one of the poorest of the series, and the color is not at all calculated to show off a fine engraving. It's very similar to the New Brunswick Scots Number no. 1 as printed in 1851. The old style of three cent postage stamps had there on the face of Washington out of compliment to a good man. It now has a railroad scene to represent how congressmen make money. Our old postage stamps were really neat and pleasing in their appearance. They were national and American as they ought to have been. The head of Washington was venerable and our three cent stamps were as perfect as they could be. But now, think of the miserable, confusing looking thing with the wretched printing that the, the post office has given us for the present three cent stamp. It's neither historical, national, beautiful, nor anything but a paltry evidence of the fact that the same engraver has got paid or will get paid for a job that ought never to have been done. 
Can our authorities not let well enough alone? Canada, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia all have railroad engines such as ours. What is there in a big chimney on a railroad carriage to indicate the nationality of our postal system? Some of the different grill marks with, you know, that if you happen to see some of these stamps with these different grill marks, the double grill marks, and want some on top of the others and that kind of thing. Uh, some people collect these and they're somewhat more valuable, so you might want to look on the back side of the stamp. Um, since this is a very, very popular design, you'll see a, a lot of little variations of the of the stamp, which we often do with the engraved stamps, see shades of color, and uh, also with the grill marks. And there was a slight variation in the printing above. There's a little triangle above the OS and the postage, if you want to look very carefully. Without grill marks, this is very rare. Again, no exception, uh, as long as it's the first printing. The second printing did not have grill marks to make it more confusing. Okay, this is, um, we honor George Washington finally here. Uh, so we sort of throw up a few of those. Uh, originally it's designed for five in the last month they changed it to six. I don't know why. Color is ultramarine. You know, in those days, they used to cut a stamp in half for half its value. Yeah. And if you had one of those cut in half on a cover, on, a, on an envelope, it's extremely rare. They only know one of these. It's cut in half, and it's worth $50,000, I think. Just a minute. Is that what it said? Uh, it's not, not known without grill marks, okay? And a vertical half used in a three-cent stamp cover was worth about $50,000. I had no appreciation for covers until I started working on this. <laughs> this stamp is especially hard to find well sent. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. You have a question back there. No, no, I don't. I, was, I mean, I've been a uh, long time now. Uh, there, there used to be an organization called Philatelic Research Association for 1869 issue. Oh, really? How many of you knew that there was a uh, heard of it? Very, very active. Well, I was a member for a long time. I did some research articles on this issue with other members. And it's probably one of the most popular series among uh, US and foreign collectors. Uh, and most recently, last month, I believe, Seagull uh, auctioned uh, one of the most outstanding ex uh, exhibit collection. Uh, you know, and I think the library will have a copy of the catalog, I'm sure. Uh, just as a side, those of you are going to come, come to the Rompex show, I have a one frame exhibit, which includes a cover with a six cent going to England, and another one with a 12 cent going to England. Wow. So you can touch. Well, well, I should look for it. I think, uh, thanks for your comment. Uh, I'm not surprised that it's, it's a very popular with, with collectors. Yeah. I didn't realize it's that popular though. Well, okay. The six cent stamp was used for a double domestic letter rate and for the single letter rate to Canada and Great Britain. The favorable comment reported in the American Journal of Philately was probably due to restoring the portrait of the first president to the 1969 issue, or 18, sorry, 1869 issue. Six cents, head of Washington, same color as the last, the three cent ultramarine, which is a fault in the collector's eye, although it works no better to no better advantage in this design than in the preceding one. Although it is a handsome stamp and ranks second in our estimation. Oh, shield and eagle, it's a yellowish orange. Uh, it is not known without grill marks as the first US stamp with a bird and probably with a shield as well. Oops, we we'll us back up. Okay, let's let read about this one. A 10 cent stamp was needed for single letters to Germany, Austria, Brazil, and a few other countries by certain routes. Alaska, Cuba, St. Thomas, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, British West Indies, and to and from China and Japan by certain ships via San Francisco. So you have to know what ship your letter was going to go on. The opinion of the day, as reported by the American Journal of Philately, was that the new issue had a very poor color for any stamp, and certainly it is not showed off to any advantage by the design. 
Ah, here comes the bird of freedom, the eagle, mounted on a shield, a novel design for a postage stamp, but rather common for an advertising label, something similar having been used rather extensively for that purpose by the Metropolitan Express Company of New York. This stamp would be beautiful as a color or any other than orange. Okay, let's go to the next one. Well, Sam, now I would, uh, this is a, to me amazing engraving that to show the, the depth of the, the, you know, you, see, you can see the depth in this engraving. And these stamps are small, that little picture. And as um, it's the U.S. Adriatic it's steamship, it was the fastest steamship at the time, but it was only in service by the U.S. for a short period of time. Then they sold it to Great Britain. Um, it's 12 cent was used to send letters to England, I think. And its colors were uh, yellowish green and a bluish green. Um, it shows movement uh, of, uh, and it shows improvement in the movement of mail from from a ho uh, horse to locomotive, now steamship. Uh, is not known without grill marks. And this stamp was engraved by James Smiley as one of the world's most famous engravers. Go ahead and read about that. The 12 cent value was used for double weight domestic letters and supplementary mail to Great Britain. I mean, 12 cents steamship green. Originally, this was very fine, but was spoiled along with the most of the others by enlarging the figures. But it still retains sufficient beauty to give it a foremost place in our albums. Okay, read about James Smiley. Okay, James Smiley. The artists reported to be responsible for this 12 cent stamp are James McDonoghue for designing and James Smiley for the vignette engraving, with George Thurber engraving the letters and the frame. James Smiley, who also engraved the vignettes for the 15 and 24 cent stamps of this series and the 30 cent Burgoyne essay, was considered a true master of his craft. James Smiley was, in my opinion, this guy's opinion, the best the miniature pictorial engraver of all times. And he is conceded to be the best landscape line engraver of America. His work was distinguished by minute detail, delicacy, and great softness. It was a contribution of line engraving and acid etching, which greatly separated the distant planes, as in the picture, thus right. producing great depth and distance. This is a 15 cent series, and there are two stamps here. It commemorates uh, the landing of Columbus, and, uh, and it's two colors. It's the first bicolor stamps issued by the United States. Um, and what they did is they printed the picture first and then the frame. So some of the frames are upside down to the picture, if they're upside down. The one I, on the, um, I believe the one on the right is the first one, and the one on the left is the second one. And uh, the 118 is much rarer than 119. Uh, it has a, a much smaller frame around it. What happened is they couldn't get that frame around the picture centered very well, so they added to the frame so they could allow for a little bit of flop in the centering because it is a two-step process. They print, they printed the blue first, and then they uh, they uh, and then they put put the frame around the picture. And they found they couldn't fit it too well, so they changed it about one month into printing. They changed the little frame on this one. Um, is this okay? Let's read about this one. The 15 cent stamp covered the rate for a domestic registry fee as well as the single rate to France, Switzerland, Germany, and Italy by certain routes. The basic design, uh, oh, okay, we read that one. There are three types of the 15 cent stamp. A comparison of the types illustrated will disclose the differences. In type one, the vignette is framed by a single line which crosses the top of the picture in a straight line. Below the T of the postage, a small white area comes to an apex. This type is generally for, referred to as without frame. About a month after the release of the first design, type two appeared, 
Here the picture is enclosed in a border of three lines, the middle being one being a thick one. Under the letter T of postage, this forms a small diamond-shaped ornament. This type is described as with picture framed or with diamond. Okay, um, that's, that's good enough. Okay. And then when they printed, reprinted them, they went to a third type. So that's how the three types this one. Okay. The engraver was James Smiley. And uh, th this is the first inverted stamp uh, that the U.S. printed by accident. And if you have one that's meant, it's probably worth about a million dollars. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if I recall correctly, this is the first stamp that was also uh, known in, uh, uh, available as a coin. As a coin? Mm -hmm. ah, but the first U.S. stamp is a coin. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Happy to share what I knew I know. <laughs> wow. Okay. And the 24 cent stamp is signing the Declaration of Independence, bluish green and violet. This is uh, one of the this is one of the finest examples of engraving by James Smiley. And you can see you can recognize 42 pictures, 42 persons in this tiny little stamp. And if you have a magnifying glass, you can recognize six persons. But you have to have a magnifying glass to recognize them. That's how fine this engraving is. And I guess this is why I guess was attracted to these stamps. It was just amazing detail in this work. Okay, let's read about this. This value was used for heavy domestic mail and to make up certain complex high international rates. The American Journal of Philately, continuing its evaluation of the series, compares the 24 cent design with the 15 cent stamp and comments, the same remarks will apply to this, only a little more so. It is very poor. Mason's, some guy named Mason's judgment was similar, but a little more lengthy. This stamp is open to the same objections as the last, excepting in one respect, the date under the representation of the Declaration of Independence, which occupies the entire center of the stamp. The picture should have been named directly over or beneath it. It is true, the date, 1776, is there, but what does that signify? Strangers, especially foreigners, would stare at the group of stately-looking Quakers and wonder whether they were enjoying a peep of Congress or gazing into the President's house at all. Okay, now the next stamp, this was the original design for the next stamp. This is not stamp, of course. This is, um, uh, this is uh, Scott's 2590. It's supposed to be 30 cents, but hardly anything changed at this design as, uh, uh, from the 30 cents, with, which was already to print, and at the last minute it was withdrawn. And it was the surrender of, of um, Bergman uh, at Saratoga uh, to Heathrow Gates. Um, and um, why was it why was it withdrawn at the very last minute? Do you have any objection? Any idea? You know, it's possible objection. This is a humiliating defeat for England. Maybe there's too many copies of John Trumbull's paintings, <laughs> which is Independence and some of these others were his as well. But for some reason, the very, maybe within days, it was withdrawn. And um, they had to get a substitute. So this was not issued until, I don't know what, when the 2590 was issued, probably in, 2010 or something like this, I don't know. But uh, this issue is a dollar stamp instead of 30 cents. In the 90s, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it was, it was in the 90s, I think, because the 2590, the Scott number 2590, that's, I mean, that's years ago. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but this is what they ended up with. And I will show a couple of slides that I have. Just this, this is the 30 cent that he ended up with. Shield, eagle, and flag, pretty similar to the 10 cent, except that they now have a um, bird on top and flags. Well, they have the flags that they added the flags. But this stamp was very heavily criticized when issued. Um, and it's the first stamp to illustrate the U.S. flag. And let's believe what the public had to say about that or the 
Um, the 30 cent stamp covered the double rate to France and the other countries requiring the 15 cent rate. It was also used for heavy domestic mail and to make up high foreign rates. It can be observed that the 30 cent is similar in design to the 10 cent stamp, but the shield is supported on the sides by American flags and the inscription of the value are altered to 30 cents and a numeral 30. This is the first U.S. stamp to depict the American flag. The comment by the editor of the American Journal of Philately at the time was, the meanest looking stamp we have ever seen. We find this more of a bunch of rags hung out at a joke shop than anything else. They, they said what they thought. I like this is the last of the series that 90 cent is Lincoln. Uh, only one of the series that does not have inverts is, is high value because of, of, it's rare because it's high value. Um, only one was known to exist on the cover and it was stolen. And a few of these stamps were sold in the southern part of the United States. I think the only place they were sold in the south was in New Orleans. It mm -hmm. wasn't sold in the south. Um, and it's, uh, Based on well, was, was it that they were not ordered by the postmasters because they thought they couldn't sell them? I don't know, but probably you're probably right. Maybe yeah, but the South would have won. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, the days uh, would be worth what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You. Uh, well, the, you know this cover that you mentioned was stolen. Is an amazing story. Yeah, it's called the Ice House cover. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And the reason it's called the Ice House cover is because it was uh, addressed to the American Ice House in Calcutta, India. Oh, really? Yeah. It was, it was bad, it's badly damaged. It was recovered by FBI eventually. There was a legal dispute between heirs uh, that, you know, the owners uh -huh. and uh, another very famous collector uh, and the heirs won. A uh, single auction house issued a special one cover auction catalog of this cover. And uh, it, it sold in six figures, but it, it, it's an incredibly rare piece. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the comment. Um, appreciate it. Uh, oh, but recently this was for George Washington, and then they replaced it with Lincoln, and they switched them around. But some people collect the different cancellations on these stamps, yeah. and there's just all kinds. I think that's the end of that. Yeah, it is. Um, you can see some different, but here's only a few. I try to pull these off online and copy them to the um, PowerPoint here, and it wasn't too successful. But there are different colors, different designs, uh, paid, red towns, steamship. One was to Japan, but all of these cancellations uh, sometimes the people collect the different cancellations too. And you notice the 12 cent, how poorly centered it is. That's very common of these stamps. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, they were reissued stamps. And they were issued in um, uh, 1875 on hard white paper with crunchy white gum. So they're quite different and uh, are much rare used than uh, used. Uh, most of the reissued ones, collectors grabbed them up while they were still mint. Uh, so they're pretty rare used. And uh, uh, so the used, a, a real used stamp of this series is quite often more expensive than the mint. Um, okay. And here, this is some, this is based on Scott's 2019 catalog value has probably gone up since then, but this gives you an idea of the, for a good condition stamp, what these various ones are, are worth. Um, you take the one cent Franklin, but mint new, the original design 600, used $140. The reissued new is actually worth less than the original, but used is a lot more. Now, if you drop down to the three cent locomotive, which is very popular originally, used is not worth very much because there's so many printed. Mint is worth fairly valuable, $250. But look what it, on the reissued is wow. $5,000 and used is $27,000. Huh. The next one. 
this this gives you the approximate quantities of of, of the reissued stamps, uh, and then uh, stamps one twenty three to one thirty two used for postage are scarce. Uh, uh, used to uh, ensure if you buy these, you want to make sure that they are indeed the reissued stamps. Sometimes you need them expertized. Um, the stamps exist which attempts have been made to press out the grill marks. Okay. And then for provision, uh, just for confusion, then one stamp was issued a third time. Um, it's 133. It now was issued on soft porous paper without grill marks again. And it's not extremely valuable uh, on the reissued. Um, it's just a one. I think that's probably about it. Is there anything left? Oh, this, what is the difference between hard and soft paper? You can see some pictures here that kind of show you the difference. That's the paper I made. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, so maybe you better eyes than I have. And this gives you an idea of the approximate numbers of stamps issued. Uh, you can see that three cent locomotive was by far the most popular stamp issued. Uh, the original design, the one that press and I guess the public didn't like very much. Like it. Well, of course, <laughs> it was used double and triple sometimes because yeah. of the rates, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that makes a difference too. So, but you see the reissued. Not many were reissued. Uh, and uh, it gives you an idea of the quantities. And um, let's see. Do I have no? No. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But one of the thoughts that that this was issued for such a short time, the National Bank Company got the contract to print these for the U.S. Postal Service at a very competitive bidding, and they they really sharpened their pencil, did everything the Postal Service wanted, and jumped over hoops to get the contract. And when they got it, it was. They did it for, I think it was 25 cents, 25 and a half cents per thousand stamps. Oh, and they had to provide the paper and the printing and everything and deliver them to the post office. And some people feel that that um, it was such a low bid that they were losing money on this contract. I wouldn't be surprised. And so they think now that some of the criticism and the and the newspapers and stuff came from the National Bank Note Company. Sure. To so they the stopped, contract. would yeah. stop printing this stamp and they'd get out of the contract. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you can, whatever story you believe, but there are a whole bunch of stories about, about this. And uh, so, so anyway, <laughs> so what has happened to pricey stamps? See, that's this particular stamp was meant, was, um, it's forty-five dollars now. It's fourteen, almost fifteen thousand. Uh, then even more because that's an old price too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, do I have another? Any yeah. more? I want to give credit to Scott's catalog. Um, the Storm Castle stamp collecting um, and to find grill marks. Um, the United States, uh, nineteen sixty-nine. That's the, the that book, those are the last two books I got most of my, and a lot of the comments that Carla read were, I think, out of the first of those two books. Um, so I'll give credit to those books. Um, any questions or any other comments about this? Uh, uh, another side line is that some of these things were used abroad, specifically in uh, Shanghai. And in the US, and in Japan, actually, there are about three or four US post offices and you can find, but uh, on the cover they're extremely expensive. I'll put it in. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But you can still find used example with uh, the Japanese stamp on it. The, the, the cancel. The cancel. Yeah. The cancel. Yeah. Here yeah. go. What the cancels look like? Because not all of them had Taiwan name. Uh -huh. Here go is one of them. Double ring. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. The here go name. The cancels are usually very faint or hard. Yeah. So you have to have a sharp eye, but. They you are used, to, uh, used in Scott catalog, and they are considerably more. Yeah.
What? When did they stop grilling snails? I think in 1875, or it was right after the series, a short time after the series. Yeah. Watermarking came in? Well, they had watermarks yeah, before and after. Yeah. I think it was a matter of cost, I think. Yep. Yeah. Because that cost of the fortune to do that after the stamp was printed, you know? Yeah. Basically, it had to be a, a, a two-step a two process. Yes. So, yeah. I once had a cover that had the 24 and the 12 on it. Yeah, yeah. And that was yes, for mailing documents from one county high. Yeah, sure. Really? Cool. So it was a thick package, evidently, when they sent it. Yeah, yeah cool. It was, wasn't the re engraved one. It was the other one. Well, other than if you want to look at Grill Mercy, well, that's about all I have to say. Well, thank you very much. Oh, no. Thanks.